Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, with everything that's going on out there, uh, you know, the temptations, the stress of, uh, was it the cares of this world, and, you know, the mass, this, I just, with all this stress and everything, the uh, people, uh, the lost world attacking Bible-believing ministries, the lies people are saying about uh, God's people, um, I just felt, why don't we just do a Bible study? always makes me feel better. <laughs> so, it's early in the morning. I have all this on because it is very cold. I leave the windows open at night um, to let the house get really cold. And then come, you know, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the house temperature is the same as outside. So, it's my own AC, basically. So, I got this on because it's very cold this morning. Um, so, uh, I thought we'd do a Bible study. Bible is Matthew. Okay, part four. Now, remember this is for instruction in righteousness. Okay. So that's where we're going through. Some of these Bible lists might apply to us specifically, but some of it applies to different people in different dispensations, whether it's the Jewish people, type, people in the time of Jacob's trouble, the millennial kingdom, whatever, the Old Testament. Um, but we can still try to get some instruction in righteousness for today. Are we dealing with some of the same stuff today of what we're going through uh, with these Bible ifs? So we are going to be turning to Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. And I ended up just doing one Bible if because I started going through this whole section realizing that there's a lot to this Bible if. More than just something so simple as we normally take it for. So we're going to go down from, all the way through Matthew starting at 16. And we're going to talk about some things as we get up to the Bible if. So, Matthew chapter 16, te chapter 10 verse 16. The reason I have this up here is there's space between <laughs> the shelves that it shows back the back wall and the closet and everything. So I decided to put the banner up like that. But I have this banner up to show that I love the fact that the Word of God is above my head. Okay. I don't correct this book, this book corrects me. If someone wants to correct me, a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, they can correct me through Scripture. Okay. This is God's perfect written word. This is my final authority. This is my standard. This is your final authority. This is your standard. Okay. Not the words of men. Not the traditions of men. Okay. Not the flesh of men. Okay. This is the authority. Join the King James Bible believers. Let's have our King James Bibles out and following along. Hold your hand here, like I said, as we go. We're going to be turning to other scriptures as we go along. So let's get this Bible study started. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. I'm starting to realize that more and more today. As I go, as I grow in Christ. And as I try to do more and more in the ministry, I'm realizing this more and more as sheep in the midst of wolves. But ye therefore, be the, ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves? Is there a good example in the Bible of this? Well, turn to Acts chapter 22, uh, verse 24. Acts chapter 22, verse 24. Now, in Acts chapter 22, Paul's trying to preach the gospel. Okay. But I'm going to read 24. Acts 22, 24. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging. Scourging is whipping. Beaten. That he might know wherefore they cried so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, how dare you do this to me? I'm a good person. And blah, 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 and yada, yada. He uses cunning, brothers and sisters of Christ. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman? And uncondemned. He just says, hey, do you realize that you're going to be scourging a Roman? And someone who's uncondemned. Paul is a Roman citizen. He's not a Gentile. He's a Roman citizen. You can get citizenship under other countries, even though you're not... Um, uh, kindred, it's not your kindred. Okay. Verse 26, When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. 
Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. Okay. He, didn't, he didn't say anything at first, but when it came the need to say, Hey, I'm a Roman, Paul said, Hey, I'm a Roman, a Roman citizen. Okay. But is that all? I love this part. If you turn to Acts chapter 23, verse 1, this is where it really gets in where Jesus is saying, Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Okay. Acts 23, 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, this is after he's preached the gospel to them, they want nothing to do with the gospel, and they're just wanting him killed, you know. So, and Paul earnestly beheld the council and said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou wicked wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? He corrected the man. But guess who that man was? And they stood by, and they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Like a Levite. Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was a high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now was Paul speaking evil of him? No. Paul was correcting him, saying, Hey, you're not abiding by the law. But here's where it gets good. Verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead am I called into question. And when he had said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. So you got all these people coming together to attack Paul for preaching Jesus Christ. Right? What does Paul do? He turns them against each other. Okay. He realizes, this is another thing, he realizes, brothers and sisters in Christ, that they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. There's nobody wanting to accept the gospel. They all just reject him. At this point, he turns them against each other. Verse 8, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angels nor spirit. But the Pharisees confessed both, and there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And I'm reading this, and it's like, they weren't even listening to Paul. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they weren't even listening to Paul. Paul's preaching Jesus Christ, who these scribes are against, but the moment he says, you know, I'm a Pharisee, oh, he's one of us? Oh, well, in that case, if he's, if he's speaking from God, then we can't fight against God. And it's like they forgot exactly what he was saying. But bottom line, he used what we read in Matthew 10, 16. Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He didn't fight them. He didn't go crazy. How dare you and, and, and everything. And, and go off, lose his temper, and on and on and on. He was wise. He saw that there were two people that were opposing each other. They were opposing Jesus Christ together, and he was wise. And he was harmless. Okay. He was a Pharisee, in title. Probably had a piece of paper <laughs> at one time. He was a, a Pharisee, in title. And of the hope and resurrection of the dead, am I called into question? He believes in the hope, Jesus Christ, and the resurrection. Okay. So, once again, you see there that we're called to be wise as serpents. Why? Because we are going to be sheep being sent out amongst the wolves. Right. We've got to be careful about what we say, and we've got to be wise in how we do things. Matthew 10, 17. I've made mistakes. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I've made mistakes. So back to Matthew 10, verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up. I underline that. They will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in the synagogues. We read how they wanted to scourge uh, Paul. 
And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Right. Let's look at some of the stuff. Men will deliver you up. Acts 21, 26. Let's go back to what we were talking about with Paul. Okay, Who was it that turned him over to the Romans? Or the Romans came and found out, but who was it that was turning him over to the leaders of the pe people? Acts 21, 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day purified himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Remember what we read up there? Uh, Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, to the synagogues. Cry out, me, crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. Now verse 29 is interesting. They're accusing him of bringing in Gentiles into the holy into the, their synagogue, the holy place. Verse 29, for they had seen before with him in the temple Trophius and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. They just lied. They saw something else and then tried to apply it over here and they used it to lie to make Paul just sound worse and worse and worse and worse. But who was it that turned Paul over? It was his fellow Jews, his fellow Jews as far as his bre brethren, as far as his blood kindred. You know, they turned them over. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we saw them see this today. Right? I've seen families uh, fall apart because one person gets saved and the other person's a professing Christian and they'll turn you over. Uh, we've got a brother in Christ right now that I'm praying for that she's getting advice, his wife left him and she's getting advice from a pastor. Right? He's, eternal. he's a heretic. He, he doesn't believe in the Trinity. Praise the Lord. Right. He actually believes in the King James Bible and he, he, he believes you shouldn't correct it or anything. Praise the Lord. He believes in the Godhead. Right. It was, right. Now they were scourged. Let's look at a situation where they were actually scourged. Turn to Acts chapter 5 verse 38. Scourged for Jesus Christ in His Word. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. Talk about Peter. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and... When they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer the shame for his name. That's, that's something you really don't see that much anymore. It's kind of hard uh, when you see people that, are, that you love and care about turn against you and they're doing this evil stuff to you, the beating them, whipping them, commanding them not to preach about Jesus. You come up thanking the Lord for it. All the hard times you go through your life, the suffering you do for Jesus Christ because you stand for His Word with the life that you live. Not just word of mouth, but the life that you live. Not putting on a show, but actually living a life of Christ. The suffering that you go through. Sometimes it gets hard to sit here and say, thank you, Lord, for all the suffering. Thank you for this stuff that I'm going through, that I've been counted worthy to suffer for your name's sake. Right? We need to remember to do that, brothers and sisters in Christ. But we see here that they are being beaten for preaching Jesus Christ. And 42, what would they do after they got beaten? And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. That needs to be our attitude, brothers and sisters in Christ. 
when you've got the lost world coming down on you hard, um, wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, false uh, ministries of Satan, you know, coming down hard on you, uh, what do we need to be doing? We need to be getting out there and cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. We need to get back to the Word of God and preaching the Word. Preaching the Gospel, but also preaching the Word to the body of Christ. Okay, the next part in, that, uh, in Matthew that we're reading says, Brought before governors and kings. Did that happen? No, this is Jesus saying this is going to happen. So, did it, act, did it happen? Acts 25, 24. If you want to turn there. And Festus said, King Agrippa. I had to highlight that because the king is K-king, but then you look at it, it's Festus that's saying it. Okay, a lost man saying that this guy, he's the king, he's the king, you know. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man, above whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. His own men, uh, countrymen. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, wherefore I have brought him forth before you, especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had I examination had, I might have somewhat to write. Paul was brought before a king, King Agrippa, to testify. Mm -hmm. So they were brought before kings. So when Jesus said that this was going to happen, it actually happened. Is it happening today? You look at the history of the Catholic Church, people were being brought to what to be considered governors and kings and the, like, the priests and you know cardinals and all this stuff, and they were being burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. They were being killed. Today it's still going on. They try to hide it and pretend it's not going on in a, a other country. It's still going on. Okay. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 10, 19. So we see there, Jesus is saying that they're going to be brought up before people. You're being sent out as sheep among the wolves. But when they deliver you up, Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. You know what? When Paul said, you know, I'm a Pharisee, and as of the resurrection I've called a question, I have no doubt that was the Holy Spirit in him telling him, hey, wait a minute. See these two people? They don't want to hear about Jesus Christ, these people. Turn them against each other. I won't give God the credit. I need to remember to give God the credit. I believe that. So, for it is not ye that speak that we, that we read in there. Okay? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9. Remember, so all this is about Jesus saying, when you go out and you're going to be my sheep, I'm sending you out as sheep among the wolves. This is how the world is going to treat you. The lost world. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. People need to realize that this is a spiritually discerned book. When people say that, people just think like, you know, it's just, it's all spiritual. Like, in general. No, when it's, we say it's a spiritual book, capital S, spiritual meaning that it's God's book, and God's the one that will open up to you if you are saved. If you're lost, you'll only parrot what other people say. You'll make a mess of the Bible anytime you try to branch off and go off on your own. You'll make a mess of the Bible. Because it's a spiritually discerned book. In other words, God's the one that's got to open this book to you. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, for what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. It's a red flag when you see people that are so worldly, look like the world, act like the world, 
and they try to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Uh, we've not received the spirit of the world. What's the spirit of the world? Uh, I've already done studies on this in the past, talking about the Antichrist spirit. Okay, people are going around preaching another Jesus. In uh, First and Second Corinthians, it talks about how they're preaching another Jesus, uh, preaching another gospel, and getting people to receive another spirit. You got a lot of these professing Christians today, they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, they have an Antichrist spirit in them. And as we get through, we're going to find out why. What's an Antichrist spirit? It's a spirit that hates God, that hates the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. You try to preach the real Jesus Christ to them, and they hate you for it. And they hate Him. Why do they hate you for it? I'm getting ahead of myself. Because they hate Him, the real Jesus Christ. But the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God, which thing also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. If you try to turn, look at this book with man's wisdom, you're not going to get anything. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. When I look at this book, it judges me. And when I look at this book, when I'm looking at brothers and sisters in Christ, I use this book to judge them. Are they living according to this book? Are their beliefs and stands based off of this book? God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. Okay? But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, that he himself is judged of no man. But who, know, who hath known the mind of Lord that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit of God is in us, brothers and sisters of Christ, who are saved, and he'll open this book to you. And when you're being attacked <clears throat> by the lost world, sheep among the wolves, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't bring my water, <clears throat> sheep among the wolves, um, God will give you the right words to say. There's times where God's given me verses to when I see comments, I'll type in some verse. What about this verse? What about that verse? But bottom line, when I find out that I'm talking to someone who's lost or someone who may be lost, I just err on the side of caution and I quote, I link the gospel message. Okay, it's a wake-up call. If you're truly saved and I linked the gospel message, it's a wake-up call. If you're lost and I linked the gospel, uh, it's a major wake-up call. Okay. Um, in Corinthians, Paul talks about check whether you be in the faith, talking to the Corinthians. He's addressing professing Christians. Not all of them were Christians, but they were all a lot of professing to be Christians. And then he goes on to preach the gospel to them. Again, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay. But God gives us the words to preach, to talk to people, to correct people. Okay. And it's done by the Holy Spirit. But this, what we read there in Matthew 10, 20, But the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Go back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father the child, and the child shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew 10, 34. Or jump down to Matthew 10, 34 real quick. Because we won't be going all the way down there. But I didn't want to do this first. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I have come to send a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. When you get saved, people are going to turn against you. Right. Verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's hard for some people. I've had people say, yeah, there's family, there's friends that... They do things that tempt me to go back into the world, that tempt me to go back into sin and everything. They're trying to drag me back into the world. But their family, and, and, and he that loveth father and mother more than he is not worthy of me. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
more. Okay? You need to love Jesus Christ more. There's some times where you're just going to have to say, I have to be done with that family member. I preached the gospel to them. They want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. I can't be around them. The temptation to sin, they're trying to pull me away from Jesus Christ. They could uh, be using Jesus' name in vain. They could be cussing a lot. Whatever it is that's trying to drag you back down, there's times where you just got to say, I'm done with that person, even though they're a family member, someone I care about. I've got to separate from them. Right? And it's tough. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And remember Luke 9.23, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And he that taketh not his cross... You know, these people that say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. You look at their life, they're just living such wicked lives. And they like to put on a show when they're in front of other people, but they're just living wicked lives. And you call them out on that wicked life, they don't want to re deny themselves, repent, and pick up their cross, getting rid of that sin out of their life, saying, hey, Lord, get this out and help me keep it out. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ. Through Christ. I say that so many times because people say, well, I just can't get this because you're not going through Christ. You're trying to do it yourself or you really don't want to give up the sin. All right? Through Christ. Okay? You have people that refuse to take up their cross and they, and they try to profess to be Christians. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Okay? Turn to 1 Peter 3.14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give... An answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope. When someone comes to you broken and they're asking about Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ? What's this gospel you're talking about? That's the hope it's talking about there. It's not saying you have to answer every man, all these attacks and servants of Satan. It's talking about the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It's a fearful thing to be going to hell. That's why you preach it. I was going to hell at one time, and I deserve to go to hell. I still deserve to go to hell. But by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, the blood that he shed, I came to him broken, having sorrow for my personal sins, for sinning against him. And I believed in his son, death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? I don't have to go to hell. I'm not going to hell anymore. Guess what? You don't have to go to hell. But you do it in meekness. But there's supposed to still be fear there. By the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's for, I believe that's for lost and saved. The terror of the Lord for saved. Remember the judgment seat of Christ. Be careful how you speak. Remember the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to have to answer for it if you're truly saved. We're still going to have to answer for our life. I do this because I do a little section. This small blink of an eye that we're here on this earth. Uh, there was a song that said that if we live... A thousand a hundred years down here will not regret it because he sold it long ago it's an old hymn i think maybe it's an old song that uh, a, a christian band plays um country band uh seminal stream band um but if i live a hundred years down below i'll not regret it for he sold it long ago because i'm going to be spending eternity with jesus christ okay but you're still going to have to answer for that blink of an eye as a Christian, the life that we're living down here. If we're not living according to the scriptures, and we're straying off into sin and heresies, we're putting stumbling blocks in front of the brethren, okay? um, we fall away and start teaching a false gospel, preventing people from getting saved. We stop looking for Jesus Christ. We're not sanctifying our life every day. We're not looking for Jesus Christ every day through sanctification and living your life for Christ. Right? You're going to miss out on rewards and you're going to have to answer for it. And for the lost world, the great white throne where Jesus is going to be sitting and judging him. By the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's what the fear is. Having a good conscience. A lot of people don't have good consciences. That, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, 
have this going on about me. Uh, Brother Brian's got it going on about him. Brother JT's got it going on about him. I've got some brothers that aren't even in ministry that just make comments and encourage people in ministry and fellowship a little bit with them. They're being attacked and being evil spoken of and is evildoers. It comes with being a Christian, brothers and sisters of Christ. If that's not happening in your life, I'd check whether you be in the faith. If you're making strong stands for the Word of God in your life, I'm not talking about, I'm going to pause there for a second, I'm not talking about going out into the world and purposely putting on a show like you see these people with the signs and they're trying to yell at people and they're trying to start fights and start arguing. No, you don't have to do that. You just need to live a life of Christ and stand for the Word of God. And it'll happen. Right? The speak to you as evildoers. They may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversations in Christ. Okay? When you have meekness and fear and you just preach truth, don't give in to gossip, don't give in to debating and arguing. Meekness and fear. They make fools of themselves. And they are. First okay. Thessalonians chapter 2.14 I want to put this one in here on because it talks about something very important. For ye, brethren, become, became followers of the church of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. People think that with Galatians, it's just the Gentiles were suffering persecution from the Jews, trying to be pulled back under the law, or being suffered from persecution from the Jews. There is no Jesus, even the ones that flat out rejected no, they were suffering, Gentiles were suffering, Gentile Christians were suffering from other lost Gentiles as well, from becoming Christians. Right? Someone once said, count the cost. Well, well salvation is a gift, it's free, it is, but there's still a cost. You say, what are you talking about? Uh, you could lose your family, you could lose your friends, you could lose your job. Okay? You could lose some things when you become a Christian, things you don't need. God gets them out of your life. I love my family, but if they're going to get in the way of my walk with the Lord and me serving the God, they're gone. But you're going to lose some things. Mm -hmm. But they were being attacked by... Uh, Gentiles were being attacked by Gentiles. It wasn't just Gentiles being attacked by the organized religion of, of the Jewish people. No, there was organized religions, false religions of the Gentile side that were also attacking them. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. This is something that's very important. Why do these people hate us? Why are they turning us up and handing us over to be killed and everything? 1 John 3, 11. For this is the message that ye, have, that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew him. There's a question there. And wherefore slew him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. What's going on here? They should see Jesus Christ in you. Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us, and they just think it's just some of this, you know, thing that we can just say and use that as justification to do whatever we want. No, when Jesus' righteousness is imputed to you and you truly get saved, you belong to Jesus Christ. He's going to tell you what to do and what not to do. And when you make stands for instruction and righteousness, for the right things, the do's and the don'ts, the lost world sees that and they look at themselves and see how wicked they are. And they hate you for it. You call somebody out, whether it's movies, TV shows, video games, being an alcoholic, being a drug addict, okay? um, going around and doing things that's contrary to scripture, fornication, okay? on and on and on. We stand against this. Oftentimes, when you see people that attack me, this ministry, attack other brothers and sis, uh, brothers, and probably even sisters in Christ, but brothers in Christ in ministry, um, oftentimes it's because they have wickedness inside them. Look what we saw there about Cain, okay? His own works were evil. Their works are evil. And they see Jesus' righteousness in us. My life is cleaned up by the power of God. 
I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. God cleaned up my life. And the lost world sees that. And they hate me for it. They hate me for it. Okay? And the biggest thing that you're going to get a lot of hate from is professing Christians. You kick their sin by you can kick their sin by simply by the life you live. Oh, we're doing such and such. I don't do that anymore. God's word says it's a sin. Now, am I yelling at them? No, I'm saying why well, I won't do it. God's word says it's a sin, and that they'll start hating you for it. You don't even have to go off on them and preach hardcore. You're in sin, and you should. All you do is say, I'm not doing that. I want to please God. The number one reason I'm put on this earth is to and was created was to please my Creator. Jesus Christ. Okay. Go back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 23. But when they persecute you in the city, flee ye into another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. What happens when you're trying to preach the gospel to somebody who doesn't want it? Move on to another city. Okay, they don't want the gospel, I'm going over here. You don't keep hammering the same people with the gospel. I've seen people do that, and I'm looking at them going, you don't do that. Like, you're wasting your time. There's other people that might want to hear the gospel. You preach the gospel to somebody. You're not a car salesman. You're not a, you know, an insurance salesman. You're not a door-to-door -door salesman selling you know, stuff. Okay, we're not pushing the gospel on people. We preach the gospel to people. We try to say it sometimes in a way that we think they might be able to understand it to a point. But you've got to get to a point where if someone just doesn't want Jesus Christ, you move on. You don't keep trying to sell it to them and pressure them and force them into make, saying some little prayer and get a false convert created. Right? We don't do that. We go to another city. Um, I'll be linking a video, an old video that uh, Brother Brian at King James Vineyard Ministries did. It says, when to move to the next city. That was a good study. And I, I'm going to go ahead and link that down <clears throat> at the bottom. Okay. Now, the reason I want to link that is because the doors are closing in America. We're, we're, the doors are closing. A lot of people have had brethren that they go out and they give out gospel tracts. That's their main thing that they do. They, they make a big deal. Not a big deal. How do I say it? Because for me, I have to go to town to do something. I'll lay gospel tracts places. But you have people that don't feel called into full-time ministry like what I'm doing and some of the other brethren are doing. But their side of the ministry that's full-time, that, that's they're doing full-time for the Lord is they'll print out a lot of gospel tracts and they're going into town specifically. They have no reason to go to town, but they go to town specifically just to hand out gospel tracts. And right now, with the masks being have to be used, a lot of places are being shut down. Um, people are going out of business, and it's getting to the point where doors are, doors are closing here in America. Okay, uh, you guys just find some other ways. I suggested a gospel. Uh, gospel magnets on your truck so when you do have to go to town or anything that's witnessing for Jesus Christ um, I've wore this uh, sweater King James Bible 1611 authorized version and I've had this start so many conversations with people when I walk downtown uh, but you know you might have to just stick online uh, and start doing some videos preaching the gospels online which is a good thing for the brethren but doors are closing in America. He's saying that if things get so heated that the people that you're trying to reach don't want anything to do with you, move on to another city. Okay. You can tell these people because they that are lost because they just keep coming back. The enemies of the ministry is professing to be saved. They keep coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back. And it's like, if they're saved, they'd obey God's word saying, move on to another city. They don't want the truth. This Philip guy... He's just a heretic, and, you know, because he looks like Brother Brian. That's one of my biggest attacks. He copies Brother Brian. Like, Brian has um, copyrights on everything. And he uses these as attacks. And they just, it's like, if this heretic, Philip Newton, you've already tried preaching the, your gospel to him, and you tried preaching truth to him, and he doesn't want to hear it. 
Move on to another city. Go preach to people who do want to hear it. There's a lot of lost people out there who love to hear that they can be a Christian and have the world. I won't preach that. But the, the, the point is made, though. You're done. You've proven, you make a video say, proven that I, supposedly proven that I'm a heretic and everything, you move on. You don't make tons and tons of videos over and over. But we see that being made with the brethren in ministry, the true Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries, which is why I called this ministry that, um, they just keep getting attacked over and over and over. These people just don't go away. Acts 13.46 How did Paul act? And Barnabas. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It is necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. He's talking about the Jewish people. But seeing you put it far from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now was Paul completely done with the Jews? No. If the Jew came to him wanting to hear the word, he preached to the Jews. Sometimes he still, knowing he probably shouldn't have, still tried to go out of his way to preach to the Jews sometimes. But for the most part, he focused on the Gentiles. Why? Because they were wanting to hear it. Here's an example of that. Why would Paul say such a thing? Why would Paul say, okay, I'm done with the Jews. I'm going to the Gentiles. Turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 42. You go back a little bit. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. They wanted the truth. When you find people that want the truth, that's who you preach the truth to. When you try preaching the truth to people who don't want the truth, you're wasting your time. Do you try? Paul tried. Look, it said there in Acts 13, 46, should first have been spoken to you, God, the Word of God. We spoke the Word of God to you. We didn't just take it upon ourselves to say, well, I don't think they're ready, I'm not going to preach to them. They preached the Word of God to them, but they didn't want it. And they moved on. Mm -hmm. You're going to have that. You're going to have people that attack you, people that false converts, people who flat out reject Jesus Christ, family members, friends, whatsoever. They're going to attack you, and you're going to try to preach the gospel to them. But there comes a point where it's, I'm done. Move to another city. Okay. They don't want the truth? Well, I'm going to go find somebody who wants the truth. That's the whole point of tracting. That's the whole point of going out and preaching the gospel. We're looking for people who want to hear the truth. You come across one of those people, it's a joyful, it's an amazing thing when you come across somebody who has a love of the truth and wants to hear the truth. So Matthew chapter 10, 24. Here we're going to get to the Bible if. The whole point of this study, but we, like I said, it's just so much in this verse has to do with this. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Yeah, servant of Satan. Now, I've called people servants of Satan because they are, but those of us who are standing for the Word of God, and that we line up, because a lot of the attacks I get called, when I get called a servant of Satan and I get attacked, they don't use Scripture. Why? Because they can't disprove the true plan of salvation that's found in this book. Penance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, death, burial, and resurrection, that it's God's blood that was shed on the cross, Confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. To true biblical repentance, remember, sorrow for your personal sins against God. Sorry that you've sinned against Him. Your Creator. You're not pleasing Him. That's why you were created. Mm -hmm. They don't use Scripture. Mm -hmm. Now you can go to Matthew chapter 9, 34. And I'm going to mention all three times that this is mentioned, but they called Jesus the Beelzebub. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. It's called a devil. Uh, Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. 
There, they actually use the word Be Beelzebub. Okay. Mark 3.22, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils cast he out devils. Who's the number one people that you're going to get attacked from, brothers and sisters in Christ? Jesus is in you, and if they've called Jesus Satan, <laughs> you know, servant of Satan, they're going to call you servant of Satan. But who's the number one people that are attacking Jesus and calling him that? Organized religion. False converts. You know the one people that attack me? The number one people that attack me? False converts. I don't get attacked by the lost world atheist coming on my channel saying, hey, uh, you're just, that Jesus is not real and, and blah, 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 and that book is just, you know, junk and, and blah, blah, and it's, I don't get that. What do I get? I get attacked by professing Christians. Organized religion. Right? And that's what's going to happen. Because uh, we read there, the Pharisees and everything. And why were they attacking Jesus? He was preaching against their sin. And to them, he was stealing all their power and authority. Because they were the ones that were in the power and authority over the people, not God and his word. The Old Testament. Jesus, time and time again, corrected them. You're not even following the commandments of God. Okay. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Notice what Jesus said, that talk about there, about the disciple that he be as his master. 1 Peter 1, 13. Wherefore, gird up your loins of your minds, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is it, that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. We see that a lot today. Um, I fell in this, fell for that too as a Christian, falling back into the former lusts and proved myself to be ignorant. 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I have to backtrack a little bit what I just said there. People always are going to be attacking us, brothers and sisters in Christ, who stand for the Word of God, who stand for sanctification, instruction and righteousness, the do's and the don'ts. Okay? And they'll say that, well, this person does this sin, they've lost their salvation, they're automatically lost. Please don't let them deceive you, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'm directing, I'm talking to saved sinners. I've always preached there's a difference between struggling with sin and justifying sin. I don't want to lose my spot, but justifying sin. Okay? There's a big difference. I have grace and will be, and have what we talked about their meekness and fear. I have grace, meekness, and fear for those who struggle with sin. I struggle with sin. What we're saying is, is when we get people that fly out and justify sin, they're basically saying, you can keep your Jesus. I want the world. I want my flesh. That's a big red flag. Someone who truly gets saved and comes to God broken and having true sorrow in their heart for their personal sins against God, they're not going to want to sin against God. Their heart's desire is, I don't want to sin against you, Lord. Tell me what to do. Lord, I'm supposed to please you. I want my life to be pleasing in your sight. Tell me what to do. Tell me what not to do. Right? That's their whole attitude. And you come to them with the Bible saying, hey, what you're doing there is sin. And their attitude is, who are you to judge me? Oh, I, I'm, I might be doing this, but, but you, you're doing all this over here. Here, 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 here. What are they doing? They're trying to avoid owing up to their sin. That's what we're saying. When you get people that really hold on to their sin, I love my sin, I ain't giving up my sin, to us, according to the Bible, that's a red flag. And it's a whole other study that I did about proving yourselves. You're supposed to prove you're a Christian. All right? You're supposed to prove yourselves to the Lord, to the brothers and sisters of Christ, and you're not supposed to have a good report of them that are without. You're to prove yourself to the lost world that you're a Christian. You're supposed to be set apart, be not conformed. But that's going off. But be ye holy as I am holy. We're supposed to be like Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1. I've been accused of being a 
I don't know what, how you'd say it, a Paulinian or a Paulite or something like that. Um, but 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul speaking, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We're supposed to be seeing the example in the brethren, in the body of Christ. And lately, among some of the brethren, we've been having, and I've set some bad examples too, of people that aren't being holy as Jesus is holy. They're not setting a good example for a Christian. Mm -hmm. But we're supposed to be like Jesus Christ. The world is supposed to see Jesus in us. The do's and the don'ts. How we live our lives. I give God glory for in all things. Give Him thanks in all things. If I can't give Him glory in it, I don't do it. I try to get it out of my life. It becomes a, it's a struggle with sin. Because sin does not. You can't glorify God in sin. And you can't give God thanks in sin. You can give God thanks for chastisement. You can give God thanks for opening your eyes and waking you up. And giving you the strength to get back on track. Absolutely. All right. Turn to Philippians 3.17. Philippians 3.17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Paul's saying, we're setting the example of the life of a Christian. We're living a life of Christ. God's cleaned up our life. Use us for an example. We tell you this is God's final, let's just say use me for an example. This is God's perfect written word right here. This is the foundation of my life, my home. Okay, look at my life. God's gotten a lot of stuff out of my life and he continues to help me clean up my life. Okay, we're set an example. I stand for the word of God. I stand for the do's and don'ts. I try my best to obey the Lord in instruction and righteousness. All right. The different commands, instruction rights, but like uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. People say, well, I study. Keep going. Study to show thyself approved in the God. A workman. How you live your life. Action. Not be, need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. It's all about living it. You can study it all you want, but if you're not living it, you're wasting your time. And people will go, oh, you're, I'm sorry, you're wasting your time according to scripture. You're to be a workman that needed not to be ashamed. If you're not doing the work, and you're not doing the physical act of living the life of Christ, your studying is in vain. Go back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. Now, we've gone through this, the Bible if. Jesus, they're supposed to see Jesus in you. They see righteousness in you, His righteousness. He cleans up your life because it's God's righteousness. All these instructions and righteousness is God's righteousness being imputed to us, saying, hey, oh, God's righteousness is imputed to us to wash our sins away, but it's Jesus Christ and it's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, it's time to clean up your life. You need to li live a righteous life, and you can only do it through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. That's how people see Jesus Christ in you. So, you're supposed to live a life of Christ. And when you get saved and you're not conformed to this world, you're separate. People see Jesus in you. And they hate you for it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. Fear them not, therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. More and more false converts are being brought to light. Okay? Uh, more people are being brought to light than have fallen away. They could be saved, but they're falling away. Right? Verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the, in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And that's exactly what I'm doing right now with this Bible study. I studied this Bible, the Holy Spirit... With the Lord, going through doing a Bible study, comparing scriptures with scriptures and everything, and now I'm sharing it with you. 2 Timothy 4.1. Keep your hand there, Matthew, and turn to 2 Timothy 4.1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Everybody's going to be judged, saved and lost. At his appearing and his kingdom. Catching away of the body of Christ. And when Jesus comes down for the millennial kingdom. Thousand year reign. 
That's why we call it millennial. It's a thousand. Two, preach the word. Be instant in season. Oh, people love it. People, I'm not being attacked. People love it. It's great. I'm preaching the word. Out of season. Oh, I'm really getting attacked hardcore. <laughs> Especially now. Being attacked hardcore. What do I need to do? I need to continue preaching the word of God. Even if it's out of season. Reprove. Rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Long-suffering. That's really what's going on in our lives. Long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. What did we talk about earlier? They see Jesus' righteousness in you, the life that you're living. I want to do right by the Lord. I want to do right. And their sin gets brought to light. But, uh, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And that's what they want. They want people to pat them on the back and say, it's okay. You know, your sin is okay. It's not that big of a deal. You know, who are they to judge you? You know, you're still a good person. Still a good person. That's what they want to hear. And we see that a lot of that going on right now. But after their own, let's see, verse 4, sorry. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth... And, be turn, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, adore affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof, full proof of thy ministry. Yeah. Okay. Make full proof. I have brethren that I've talked to, sis, brothers and sisters of Christ, that they've learned from me and I've learned some from them. When they uh, fellowship with me through emails, are through Skype. Okay? Uh, proof. It says right there, make full proof of thy ministry. You look at people's ministry, they start talking the talk, and it sounds great, but you, you just wait a while, and you look, and you see how they're living their life, and how they're living their life starts coming out, and it's like, they don't line up. That goes not just for ministry, that goes for anybody who professes to be a Christian. They talk the talk, but are they walking the walk? They both need to line up. A lot of people have good head knowledge. Well, I've noticed false converts that have really good head knowledge. They can come in and pose as a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian. I say that because they're not. They can pose as one, and they can pair it with they've learned from other people and, and pretend that I'm a good Christian. I'm a good Christian. I'm a good person. But after a while, their true colors start coming out. You start kicking sin. You start kicking their sin, and they start getting mad at you. You hold them accountable to the Word of God and what they, what they pr profess to believe and preach and they don't stand by it by the life that they're living. Okay? But that's what we're supposed to do regardless of the persecution that comes, that is coming and is already here. Okay? People attacking you, wolves in sheep's clothing, false converts. Okay? And sometimes you are going to get attacked by people who flat out just reject Jesus Christ. Uh, it doesn't matter if because in these last days, the real Jesus Christ and the absolute truth, when we preach truth, it's not accepted. It's not, the, it's not in season. But we're still supposed to be preaching it. The gospel, the true gospel, the world doesn't want it today. They just don't want it. And there's times where we feel like, oh, am I giving out all these, laying out all these gospel tracts and handing out these gospel tracts in vain? I, I don't know, brother, sister Christ... I'm going to be honest with you, there's times where I sit there and say, Lord, is this all in vain? And the Lord's like, keeps reminding me, we're keeping people accountable. They have to answer t to Jesus Christ when they read that gospel track or refusing to read the gospel track and crunching it up and throwing it away. Okay? We're pe keeping people accountable. Turn back to Matthew chapter 10, 28. And fear not them. Wait a second to get a turn. Let you guys turn. And fear not them which kill, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather rather fear him which able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We've already talked about that fear. I'm supposed to preach with meekness and fear, the hope of Jesus Christ. Okay, by the terror of the Lord we persuade men. Uh, we can. I didn't go to the verses, but if you want to look up the verses about the judgment seat of Christ about the great white throne, okay? about hell, 
Hell is real. People who go to hell and get tossed in the lake of fire, you will be burning for all eternity. Constant destruction. You can destroy something without it being disappeared and gone. A truck can get totaled and you say, man, that truck got destroyed. But it's still there. Okay? It's, it's, it's destruction for all eternity. You're burning for all eternity. We need to make sure, brothers and sisters of Christ, that our fear stays on the Lord Jesus Christ, not this world. Not giving in to all this bickering and fighting and the lies, the gossip, uh, people promoting sins and saying, well, maybe it's okay. Well, maybe that's a. We need to remember our fear needs to stay with the Lord. We're to fear God rather than men, we're to obey God rather than men. So. Hopefully for this study for instruction of righteous brothers and sisters of Christ, the Bible if, if they have attacked Jesus Christ to the point of killing him and nailing him to a cross because he was attacking their sin, saying repent for the kingdom of heaven, talking about the physical kingdom is at hand, and teaching that they need to please God with their life, not just with their words, you know, and make sure that their works aren't reprobate. They're doing good works for the Lord. And it's for the Lord. There's no, I'm, I'm, doing, it, I'm doing it for the Lord, but you're getting all this stuff out of it. No. If they hated Jesus Christ, when you get saved, if you're newly saved, brothers and sisters in Christ, and for those of us about out there, we can testify to it, have been saved for a while. If they hated Jesus Christ, they are going to hate you. And they're just going to do anything they can to destroy you. Uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Satan's twofold purpose, and I did this in other studies, Satan's two, twofold purpose in this life, to prevent people from getting saved. And the best way to prevent people from getting saved is to create false converts that believe they are saved. They're the most difficult people to deal with and trying to reach. The worst thing you can have is have a false convert who's starting to doubt their salvation, which is a good thing, have all these people come up and start patting them on the back. Oh, you, you poor brother or sister in Christ. Yeah, and then start getting them to believe that they're saved again. Right? But that's Satan's first purpose, is to prevent people from getting saved. He wants to see as many people go to hell which is, and, and to the lake of fire, which is where he's going. And the second part is those that do get saved, he wants to mess you up as much as possible. He wants to get in the way of your walk with the Lord. He wants to get in the way, get you to sin, to get God to punish you. He just wants to see you suffer. He wants to do everything he can to mess you up as a Christian. And we see that. Okay? So, just want this to be encouraging. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's normal. There's the Bible that we went through, but it's normal for a Christian to be hated by the lost world. In fact, it's necessary. It's evidence of salvation, okay? And I'll say this again. You go out and you're being a jerk and you're purposely trying to cause confrontation, debating, arguing, and everything, and getting into people's pay face, like I said, trying to be a car salesman, getting in people's face. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? That's not it at all. Okay? You live a life of Christ, people are going to hate you. You don't have, you're still supposed to be meek. You're supposed to, as the Bible says, if it be possible to live peaceful among all men. Okay? You're still supposed to be meek and humble. And you're still supposed to treat people, lost people, right. You don't, you stand against sin. Hey, I don't do that, that's sin. You preach the gospel to them. They don't want it, you move on. That kind of things. But by you... But you don't have to go out of your way to upset people. They'll get upset because they'll see Jesus Christ in you. And if people back when Jesus was physically walking on this earth, I can't even fathom that. We all desire that so much to be able to walk with Jesus physically and hear Him talk and teach and preach and walk with Him. If they called Him Satan, servant of Satan, they're going to call us servants of Satan. Okay? They're going to attack us. They attacked him. They hated him because he was perfect. He was sinless. I'm not perfect and sinless. But they're going to hate me because I take stands that God tells me to take. I'm not, I want this out of my life, it's gone. Sin. I want that out of my life, okay, I'm supposed to be doing this. And on and on and on. So brothers and sisters of Christ, in these last days, 
Don't let them get you down. Stay focused on the Word of God. Preaching the Word. Be an instant in season. There is uh, 2 Timothy 4 2 that we talked about already. Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm trying to exhort you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I understand what you're going through. I'm going through it. Okay, in these last days, it's getting tougher and tougher. Our flesh is tempting us more. The lost world's trying to tempt us more. We've got more attacks coming in from the lost world. And it's getting tough out there. And it's getting tough here. But remember, your home is the number one place that you can make godly. I always tell people that. That's your number one place that you can make godly is your home. You can get it to abstain from all appearance of evil, put no wicked thing before thine eyes. God might still show you some things and convict you of some things years down the road, and you'll be like, okay, I need to get rid of that. But that's a constant thing. But your home should be a place where you can go to, and you're not being torn by the lost world and temptation to a point. I'm still tempted, even though I'm here, by things because my thoughts, we're supposed to bring our thoughts under subjection, okay? not have vain imagination, and we're supposed to be meditating on the Lord and good things. So, but you know what I'm saying? Your home is a place that you can really make a godly home. So, now I'm kind of rambling a little bit. I'm sorry about that, brothers and sisters of Christ. But you're going to get attacked. Stay strong. Stay in the Word of God. My prayers are going out to all of you, brothers and sisters of Christ, in these last days. I'm seeing brethren being torn apart because... Uh, some brethren want to hold on to sin, some don't, and say, I'm making a stand. And I'm seeing brethren being torn apart. I see people coming out and lying about each other. Okay? All for the sake of argument and fighting and causing contention. And it's like, stay strong, stay in the Word of God, make your stands against sin, make your stands for the true gospel. But brother and sister Christ, if they don't want the truth, move on. Focus on the Word. Focus on your walk with the Lord. And if you're in ministry, focus on your ministry and preaching the Word of God to, to the lost as far as for the gospel. I'll have another video coming up talking about how my videos, if I'm not preaching the gospel, my videos are not for lost people. They're for saved. Saved sinners. Okay? But we need to be preaching the gospel and get back to preaching the Word of God. Okay, and stay with the Word of God. So hopefully this has helped exhort you, brothers and sisters of Christ, and lift you up and help remind some of you that are starting to fall, like I fell uh, a few months um, back. Uh, stay strong. Get your life cleaned up. Get back to denying yourself. Okay, Drop the pride. Uh, a haughty spirit. And when it gets to pride, pride goes before destruction. But drop the haughty spirit. Holy Spirit goes before a fall. Um, that sin's not worth it. If you're trying to hold on to sin or if you're falling back into sin, the old man, it's not worth it. Get back to your walk with the Lord. Get back to being strong in the Lord so the world can see it. And if they hate you for it, praise the Lord. But the world sees it. We're trying to get that last soul saved. And if they see it in you, you can be the one that witnesses to the last person before God goes, Jesus Christ goes, come up hither. So, so grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.